lots and lots of stories in the late ancient, early medieval period that elaborate in all sorts of imaginative ways on the information, the meager information given in the Gospels. One story that I wanted to draw attention to comes from a text known as the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew. It exists in a lot of different versions. The version I'm thinking of was edited by Tischendorf in 1876. It's a text that survives in Latin, though there's probably a Greek, possibly a Syriac text underlying it. This version may date from the mid sixth century, though a lot of these texts are quite hard to date. It's about the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt to escape from Herod and the slaughter of the innocents. In this version of the tale, two full years have elapsed between the birth of Jesus and the arrival of the Magi, the wise men. They've spent all that time traipsing across the countryside, following the star, looking for where the child is. So Jesus is a toddler by the time the family flee from Herod down to Egypt. And as they're on the road, this refugee family, they're tired and hungry and thirsty. Mary is exhausted and asks to stop to rest. And Joseph helps her dismount from the, presumably the donkey, the text just says, the animal that she's riding on. And she lies down under a palm tree and she looks up and sees at the very top of this very tall palm tree, dates. And she says she wishes that it were accessible, that, that they could actually get the dates uh, because they're all so hungry. Joseph says that it's totally impossible. The tree is so tall and that what he's worried about is actually the water supply because their water skins are now empty. So the little two-year-old toddler at that point calls on the tree to bend down. So the tree, in obedience to its Lord, it, its creator, bends over. They harvest the dates from it and eat them. And then he commands the tree to rise back up again and to bring forth a fountain of water from its roots, which, of course, it does, and a fountain of cold, pure, clear water comes forth. The little family spends the night there under the shelter of that tree. And in the morning, as they're about to set out again on the next phase of their journey, the toddler, Jesus, calls for an angel to come and pluck a branch from that palm tree and carry it to paradise and plant it. And it's from that cutting, that shoot of this palm tree that sheltered the Holy Family, that the palms of victory will come, that all the saints receive when they enter into the kingdom, when they enter into their heavenly reward in the presence of God the Father. The palm of victory associated with the saints especially with martyrs in the early church and in the medieval church. And I like that story partly because of its domesticity, uh, the idea of this little family sheltering, trying to find food and drink, partly because of the way it resonates with problems we're so familiar with in our world of refugees who are tired and hungry and thirsty, and partly because of the way it has a promise because, of course, in our world, those tired and hungry and thirsty refugees can't simply summon palm trees to bend down or springs of water to, to rise. They continue being tired and hungry and thirsty. And in this story, as it were, you can see our cold, cruel world being broken open, in a sense, to see the promise and the love and the hope inside it. And it's important for the story that at the end, at the end in the kingdom, the reward the, the, the saints will receive is connected with that palm tree and that domestic, quiet little scene at the beginning. That the hope which is given for a better future for all of us, for our whole world, that hope is rooted and grounded in the story of that little family in the intimate story of the birth of that child. It's a story which has often been reproduced in medieval art down the centuries. It appealed uh, to the medieval imagination and was elaborated in all sorts of ways. So that's the little story I wanted to tell.